Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Centering Perspectives, a discussion of Black equity in landscape architecture. This webinar is a collaboration between the ASLA New York chapter and the ASLA student chapter. My name is Annie Pausawad. I'm the co-chair of the Education Committee of the ASLA New York. The format of tonight, we will listen to presentations from each of the panelists. Then the guest moderators will kick off the roundtable discussion. If time permits, we will take questions from the audience. To participate, you can type a question in the question box or simply upvote questions you see. Do not type questions in the chat box as we will not be monitoring this. While this is not a CEU event, therefore there is no quiz at the end, there will be an evaluation form popping up in the chat box at the end and emailed to you that we would appreciate if you would fill out. Before we get started, I like would like to do a quick three question poll to see who is in the Zoom room. Please take a few seconds to play. Okay, thank you. Next, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our first speaker. Andrew Sargent is a landscape designer and a design technology pioneer in the field of landscape architecture. He will be the first ever Rose Landscape Architecture Fellow with the Enterprise Foundation and will be starting his work in fall 2020. He is also an Olmsted Scholar and an Olmsted Scholar Fellow with the Landscape Architecture Foundation, Vice President of the Board of the Urban Studio located in DC and a board member of Black Land. Welcome, Andrew. It's great to be here. Thank you, Annie. Well, um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, took the time out to kind of craft this quick presentation, um, you know, kind of quick disclaimer that, you know, these are perspectives or opinions of my own and not of uh, the many organizations that I'm, I'm, I'm a part of. Um, it's a very interesting time that we're in right now reflecting on um, where landscape architecture is in regards to equity, um, not only within the, um, the body of the profession, but also in regards to the work that we do. Um, next slide. Um, so, you know, I think landscape architecture is in this kind of duality. And I think um, um, if you were part of a, a Cuffill event um, that uh, we did, the Urban Studio did, um, I think it's almost a month ago. Um, Stephen Lewis kind of presented this uh, really eloquently and he's saying that, you know, um, part of the American population or the population of the world was living in two separate worlds. One, one world that was kind of uh, aware of, you know, racial injustice, police brutality, and things like that. And another um, world where um, folks were living in where this wasn't really a, um, a thing. And I think the, the death of George Floyd um, kind of put those two worlds in, in, in the same space and time and then people are kind of occupying a space where the lived experience that's compromised for most individuals was now um, an available reality for, for other people. Um, and there's there's kind of that same duality in regards to landscape architecture. You know, there's like a professed attachment to progressive ideals, whether it's environmental justice, climate change, um, action, um, you know, social justice and all these things that um, are kind of the, the talking points of a lot of landscape architecture um, projects and, and professionals, but um, without you really widespread actual adoption and accountability. And this is, this is really, um, uh, key when, when we're talking about equity. So, you know, um, next slide. I think it's, it's, um, it's something that you really understand from, you know, where it sits perspective kind of thing. So I think, you know, what we've seen in, in regards to, you know, people's stories on social media, it's kind of, uh, where, where you, where you are is, is what you see. So a lot of black, um, practitioners and professional students have come out to recant stories of, you know, um, 
bias um, in, in their own kind of um, um, institutions, whether that's in a university or an office. And then, you know, again, what I'm saying is that there's, there's, there has not been, um, you know, that kind of um, uh, focus on it prior to what has happened um, this year in 2020. So I think there was kind of an understanding that maybe landscape architecture was, you know, uh, a pretty progressive profession. But I think, you know, as people start to really pull the magnifying glass to what is actually being done within the profession, again, not just the work we do, but the actual body of um, our profession, people are starting to see a different, different kind of trend. Um, and next slide. And, you know, this slide I want to just address simply because, you know, I think opportunities like this where there's a, a level of discourse is really important. But ultimately, I think the profession of landscape architecture really has to, to, to make um, some choices here and in, in, in really um, thinking about is diversity um, really key to the evolution of the profession. I think, you know, this seems um, as many times in history is like a watershed moment where um, a lot of cultural things are happening and the profession can use this kind of as a ignition to do some things that are great. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm wary of, you know, the kind of push um, in a lot of ways to incorporate minority voices um, um, on a platform only to recant, you know, stories of, of, of racism and specifically um, how it impacts them. I think, you know, we have a ways to go to kind of see, you know, if this trend continues and then if people are not just recalling their experiences, but more talking about their work and their impacts um, in the profession. I think, you know, there's well enough room for curiosity and understanding um, in terms of people's uh, um, interpersonal kind of uh, experiences, but then um, there's also um, space for responsibility and, um, and dignity in terms of creating um, ways to make the profession better. And again, I think, you know, we shouldn't leave this up to collective bodies of, of landscape architecture. So ASLA membership doesn't represent the entire landscape architecture community. There's a lot of landscape architects and designers that are not members of ASLA. So I think there has to be some unity among or, or actual individual accountability rather, um, you know, in, in changing, um, changing words from, you know, help to investment and pipelines to pathways um, in order to, to get more um, minority practitioners in the profession. Uh, next slide. And I, I think, you know, and as, as I sit here kind of four and a half years into, into my career as a young practitioner, um, the rest of the presentation is kind of focused on young practitioners, specifically minority practitioners um, and understanding again, you know, this, this being a moment in time that could be capitalized on um, to kind of shift your momentum from complacency to consistency. I know it's, it's tough, but I think, I think there's, there's a lot that can be done. I think, you know, your lived experience is extremely critical right now and your voices in the conversation um, need to be here, heard. Um, next slide. And then also, kind of I you know identifying what um, again we want to see from the profession you know not a cloudy vision of just a more diverse profession you know African Americans making up two percent of, of the population of, of uh, I think landscape architects like what is this more diverse profession that we're that we're talking about and how do we execute on that um, next slide and then lastly, again, um, you know, speaking again to the timing um, of things, you know, uh, this is one moment in time that I think is, 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 is ripe with opportunity, but we don't know when the next moment in time that's going to um, coalesce with, you know, um, societal kind of um, uh, factors that are, that are uh, pushing us to make better decisions. So I think we need to start now and then continue to push forward for change. Next slide. I'm gonna say uh, lastly, to mindsets from to to young practitioners, you know, switching mindsets from you know I don't have enough reach or I don't have enough experience or skills to starting where you are, um, use what you have and do what you can, and eventually you you soon gain the reach, experience, and skills. Um, and last last next slide, and I'll say you know again to minority practitioners, you know, escape the competition through authenticity. Um, as we start to increase in numbers, we have a lived experience that um, is not within the field right now. And, you 
you know, I think that that is extremely valuable and people should be proud of that and, and be able to celebrate that with their practice. Um, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Our next speaker, Mercedes Ward Samba, is a registered landscape architect working for New York City Parks over the past seven years, passionately changing the face of Brooklyn Parks. Her work involves collaboration with various city agencies, elected officials, private landscape architecture firms, engineering firms, and local community groups. She previously served as a member of the ASLA New York's board and as the education chair, which means she was once sitting where I am now and I have some big shoes to fill. Welcome, Mercedes. Thank you, Annie. So I would like for us to delve into black equity in landscape architecture from my perspective. Next. So in our practice, we have our precedents, our existing conditions and analysis, and we have our renderings and our CDs. In life, we all have perspectives of our past, our present, and our future. I'll be giving some background of, on my past, my perspective of strides we've made in the profession related to diversification, and my opinion on some of the tepid changes that have occurred. Next. Next. So I grew up in a single parent household. Um, the early years were rough and we experienced hardships. As I got older and things became more stable, I was not poor enough for financial aid, um, but not well off enough to make it to and through college comfortably. I've always been an ambitious person and fairly confident in my abilities and I've challenged myself in school and my hobbies. I went to Penn State University and there I had a GPA dependent scholarship um, and a couple of one-time scholarships from essays and other competitions. While in school, I did feel supported and encouraged by a few professors and that made a huge difference. We also had an unforgettable week long charrette with Walter Hood. I was the only person of color and the only non-white person in my graduating class. I still had to consistently keep one or two part-time jobs while in undergrad, while balancing studio hours, aiming for a 3.4 GPA to keep certain scholarships, and still had to take out a large amount of high interest student loans each year. Because of the recession around 2009, there were no internships for students and even graduating in 2011, um, finding work fresh out of school was um, impossible with little to no connections. So after graduating college, I moved to New York and I struggled to find work, to pay rent, to so support myself. Again, I was working multiple jobs in retail, tutoring, and I took an unpaid internship at the Parks Department. I ended up getting a full-time paid position with Parks a year and a half after graduating. After a few years, I got licensed and found myself working on projects I was invested in and finally making a living wage. Because I was a young black female working for the largest agency of landscape architects in the country, I stood out to organizations such as ASLA National to contribute to conversations about diversity issues. I attended a few of the pivotal national diversity summits in Washington, and we were encouraged to go back to our respective state chapters and get involved and use our perspectives. I then served on the ASLA New York board and focused my efforts as chair of the education committee. We all know a handful of notable black landscape architects and they definitely deserve that recognition, but that isn't enough. I believe our profession is only about 4% black, but the country is about 14% black. But making names is not the same as instituting change and there needs to be cultural shifting. Next. In current days, we should all be still reflecting on the history of this country and reflecting on the history of our profession and potential wrongs committed within it, we should be analyzing not only metrics, but also culture. 
And we need to be trying to understand reasons why this country has so much inequity and what we can do to actually change this from our own perspectives in our own bubbles and landscape architecture being a very important one. Next. So what is diversity? Diversity to me is a, vi a variety of people, genders, races, cultures, backgrounds, abilities, strengths, left brains, right brains. And diversity is not 85% white. Diversity is not 85% black. I once had a retail job where maybe 70% of the employees were black and maybe 30% were Latinx. And this was here in New York City. The white manager said, we value diversity at this company. Just look around the room at all of you. That's not diversity. That was a room full of black and brown people at orientation for a minimum wage part-time job. That's not equity. On both sides of the spectrum, that's not what diversity is. So where are we at? As a country, there's a lot of reflection going on, a lot of learning, and a lot of standing up for what we believe in. This is transcending into professions because we're all human. We the people make up this country, and we the people make up the professions that keep the country running. I think we all realize something is off, um, and so many bigger picture changes need to happen. But in our profession, we're at a point where we need to be consciously making efforts to improve work culture and to diversify responsibly. We need to be supporting Black students in landscape architecture programs and supporting and uplifting Black people practicing already through um, project assignments, how we conduct group discussions, not supporting discrimination, humbling ourselves, cutting out microaggressions, and giving Black people opportunities in higher management positions, or Black people just taking those alternative pathways up for ourselves. How do we value diversity? In too many instances, white neighborhoods, for example, are valued more and invested in more. Homes owned by white people are appraised for much more, even with the same conditions. The same thing can also happen with Black prospective employees. We need to literally value diversity in landscape architecture programs and offices with investments of time, social intelligence, and money. That goes for recruiting and for retention. Tokenism and fake listening can quickly make Black people feel undervalued. Sometimes white people think they're championing Black voices, but sometimes it can be superficial. We need to be cognizant of this and delve deeper. So what's in it for us? Diversity adds value to all of our experiences, our insights, and it continues our social education through life. We would be taking steps towards social and economic justice in America. We would have less tokenism, less white fragility, more growth, and more understanding. Next. Now that many of us are willing to look through other people's lenses and we're charged up, if you will, um, we can focus on what to strive for in our future as a profession. Next. The changes we ultimately see should reflect the values of a progressive design profession. This goes beyond just hitting a metric of 14% landscape architects being black. Curriculum, work culture, and hiring practices need to change. And this may be an up unpopular opinion, but there might not be 14 black landscape architects out of every 100 black lands out of every 100 landscape architects for a while, and that's okay. Perhaps more black teams will want to go into medicine or engineering or modeling or sports, and that is okay. That's okay if we're all given the scope of what is possible and given the opportunities. And if only a handful of Black teens are interested in landscape architecture after the opportunity and support is presented to them, that is okay. We are free-willed. But people need to feel welcomed by the programs, the curriculum, and the offices. As long as the resulting number is the result of good intention and forward-thinking effort, that is okay. We shouldn't get so lost in the metrics or milestones that we forget the completeness of the intention. The atmosphere within the programs and the offices, opportunities being extended to people of color and upward mobility for everyone, I think positive change will happen that way. 
loosely tied to all that, I think landscape architecture also needs widened strongholds uh, and increased value from a legislative le level down. Um, it would be great for landscape architecture to be more recession proof and ensure that graduate graduates can keep um, jobs, get and keep jobs that they worked so hard to work for five or more years. If I graduated high school in 2008, the recession would have been more at the forefront of my mind um, when picking a, a career path. And because of the lack of generational wealth that black people and many people of color experience at a much higher rate than white people on average in this country, I probably would not have chosen landscape architecture. This degree is one of the most expensive non-medical degrees to obtain. And then upon graduation, I was still very focused on looking for jobs that seem to offer a sense of job security. Tied to governmental changes, I hope that as a country, the cost of education is not such a crippling burden and that more people can pursue careers that they're fulfilled in. I hope that landscape architecture eventually does reflect the cultural diversity of this country, but never reflects the current state of the union. Our field can represent the diverse communities that make up the future we want to see. Black equity requires intention and long lasting motivation, but I do see it for the future of this profession. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. Our next speaker, Elizabeth Kennedy, is the founder of EKLA, an open space management consulting firm in Brooklyn. As a design trust for public space research fellow, she is a recognized expert in the interpretation of cultural sites through landscape design and is also known for her innovative work in green infrastructure. Her work has received awards for excellence in design, stormwater management, and preservation. Welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to be a little less organized than our, our two preceding speakers because um, you probably hear in the background the microwave going and people arguing about uh, drawings and, and what should be on a, a particular sheet because um, I'm in the office and we're actually shredding for a deadline tomorrow but that's how it goes. Um, I thought that what I could contribute to this conversation um, this evening is obviously a perspective um, on what I would call equity in practice. Uh, I, I don't know if it was mentioned that I've had a firm for 25 years. Um, I happen to, EKLA happens to be the longest surviving uh, firm headed by a woman of African descent in the United States. Uh, it's not the first formed, but it's the longest surviving. And that in and of itself is <laughs> a story. Um, that I am the daughter and the niece of architects. So I'm one of those people who grew up in, in, in the industry and I didn't have too many illusions about pay. Let's put it that way. Um, but in, in um, where we are now, and I certainly didn't start out um, thinking that the practice that we have now was, was where we would be 25 years ago. Um, uh, the issue of equity is, is is really critical. One, I'm a business owner, so I have equity. Uh, I serve clients um, for whom I have a concern about their equity in, in, in the projects themselves. And I have employees um, who, in the course of uh, uh, trying to foster a work environment, uh, you know, the issue of their equity in their work and what they bring to the table in terms of their voices at, at different stages of their careers are also things that we're trying to balance all at the same time. So um, if we could see the next slide. Or we could just look at this one for hours and hours, but uh, yeah, here we go. Um, like I said, um, one of our first concerns when we come to the table, and I'll explain that we come to the table as usually as part of large consultant teams, uh, we're very infrequently are we the lead on, in that circumstance and most of the work uh, that comes our way even though we've won a ton of awards um, still happens to be because I hold minority and woman-owned business status. Um, so we are concerned with uh, obviously equity in say um, who's the project for who makes the decisions and when are those decisions made are, are critical for us because um, it has to do with our ability 
um, the way the project is structured to engage with the client. It has to do with the budget. It has to do with expectations for the outcome. And it has to do with how we can organize ourselves to better deliver services and to have the time that we need to figure out you know, what needs to be done. Uh, could I see the next slide? Uh, we, um, uh, if, if you know anything about minority and women-owned businesses, they, they struggle with growth. And um, I like to say to people, listen, um, we're not all stupid. It's, we're not all unable to figure out how to um, structure our income in such a way that we get to grow. Uh, resources happen to be staff, the quality of staff, uh, uh, people who send us their resumes um, are not necessarily sending us their resumes at the same time they're sending them to MVVA. Um, that's an issue for us. Uh, recruitment is something that is very um, uh, a, a strong issue. And to be honest with you, we don't get resumes from, from Black students. So here we are, a Black-owned firm um, committed to uh, issues of, of social justice, and we don't get these resumes. So again, in terms of the voices that we can bring to the table, again, it's about you know, who's speaking, when, and how. Uh, as a friend of mine says, who are the voices in the room? And we have to make sure that the mix of staff that we have are, are equally sensitive to issues of racial justice and social justice. And sometimes that takes explaining. Next slide. Oops, okay. Um, we have a concern or we, you know, when a project is being formulated, one of the issues is, is there equity in planning and, and development? And, and at the top level, who gets to decide on the projects that go into the public sphere? How is that decision making? Uh, how does that? How are those decisions made, and how inclusive are they from the very beginning of the process? Um, we work in the public sector, so a lot of things that we do are political. So the the levels of influence that community and and um, underrepresented uh, communities can have it it it's it's a very sort of tenuous. Uh, uh, thing in project development because there are also issues of perceptions of those communities and their power as they come to the table. Obviously, there's a lot more attention in the, pop, in the popular sphere in terms of grassroots engagement, but again, there's this split or this duality between you know, top level and grassroots decision making about what actually moves forward and gets funded. Can we see the next slide? So very key for us and, and um, the work that uh, we've been able to, I think, get the most sort of personal satisfaction out of um, has to do with the nature of equity and representation. Um, how do we represent our clients' narratives is um, really our strong point. I mean, we happen to be technically strong as well, but. Um, we have a process by which we immerse ourselves and uh, listen very carefully and uh, kind of observe the nuances about the nature of the patterns that we see in community habits and, and um, storylines. Um, and a large part of that actually comes out of um, my and my staff's uh, immigrant histories. Uh, I'm the daughter of immigrants first generation American, um, my staff is largely immigrant. And that outsider's perspective and that adaptability is, uh, is quite frankly a large part of our secret sauce. Um, and it remains sort of concentrated in our ethos because we're small. So, so those debates are on the table immediately. Uh, can, can I see the next slide? So actually these, these three slides, um, uh, 
due to the miracle of technology, they were supposed to morph together, but we couldn't figure out how to do that because <laughs> nobody over 50 knows PowerPoint. But the, the issue for us is in representation, um, you have to understand that these narratives are not static. They are not frozen in amber. Uh, stories are adapted. Uh, people come to the table with narratives that are part of the, the continuum of a storyline, but they upend the expectations about what those stories are. And so when we were working on the Reeksville Heritage Center and we were designing that meadow, at no point in time did we ever think that the meadow itself would be engaged in dance performance. That just was not in the programming idea at all. But there is a perspective that you have to take, I think, um, in doing um, cultural work and work about equity, diversity, and inclusion. That means that you have to be open to solutions that you didn't plan for. And so that changes, I think, the design, the approach to design and the design model that you use. Can I see the next slide? You know, because what's going to happen is that if the project is actually successful, often it is absolutely reimagined. Um, so you also have to sort of um, bring to the table a certain freedom about, about that engagement of spirit. Let me see the next slide. Um, very, very strongly in, in social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work is, is, is the issue of the equity and the outcome. Who protects the legacy? Who owns it? Who gets to say how it's, you know, how it's commemorated in the future? Who gets to continue the timeline? Those are very, very uh, critical questions to be um, answered and, and factored into into the aspects of your practice if you're going to be mindful of these issues. And similarly, the last slide. Um, in terms of equity in outcome, well, this is where um, uh, there's a perception that MWBs don't necessarily have the power of their own advocacy. Uh, who owns the rights to the work? Uh, I believe during the panel discussion, I'd like to go into this further, but a lot of times um, we don't have, we're not in the positions under a lot of uh, public procurement rules to be able to actually advocate um, uh, successfully on our, on our own behalf. And uh, there are instances where um, you can be punished um, for doing so, if 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 you have if you need a date to go to the dance, you have to be, you know, amenable to the date. So there there are issues around um, looking at the issue of equity, just equity, diversity, and inclusion, and social justice. That actually goes to the heart of how public contracts are actually let to the public. And with that, I will uh, return to Annie. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our last speaker, Kofi Boone, is a professor of landscape architecture at NC State University in the College of Design. His work is in the overlap between landscape architecture and environmental justice, specializing in democratic design, digital media, and interpreting cultural landscapes. His teaching and professional work has earned numerous awards. He serves on the board of the Landscape Architecture Foundation, where he is Vice President of Education. He is a frequent speaker at national conferences and events. His published work is broadly disseminated in peer-reviewed as well as popular media. Welcome, Kofi. Thank you, and I'll thank everybody. Uh, I have a very tenuous New York connection, uh, but a uh, connection to the issues, and so I'm just glad to be here with you today. Uh, fantastic presentations. I'm not going to offer slides, but hopefully we'll offer some content that will inform our conversation moving forward. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about our broader imperatives. You know, all of us human beings, the planet Earth, and therefore what does our profession have to do with it? And I think a lot about pathways, uh, including my own pathway of discovery to this particular profession and 
identifying some of the challenges and barriers along the way, not just getting introduced to it, but uh, surviving and then thriving in it. Uh, and also think about life cycles in terms of where we are in our lives, where we are in the world, and uh, are those opportunities for us to move forward together. So uh, we'll start with some imperatives. I know uh, as a part of the Landscape Architecture Foundation Board, we spend a lot of time talking about this in terms of the future of the professions. Uh, obviously climate change, you know, if you have family or friends in the Southeast right now in the Gulf Coast getting hit by Hurricane Sally, you know, our, our thoughts are with you. Uh, if you have family on the West Coast uh, dealing with uh, wildfires, you know, those are all in the purview of what we really should be talking about in terms of landscape architecture, our role in dealing with those particular issues. And also infectious disease, you know, so uh, the impacts in the landscape increase uh, the, uh, the impact and the effect of communicable diseases, but also the disproportionate impacts, which New York City, I don't have to tell you about in terms of who gets most affected by COVID, socially, economically, environmentally, uh, it's us. And so uh, there are broader imperatives that we need to be mindful of as we start to think about the future of the professions and in our role as Black people and Black culture. Uh, social equity and environmental justice, you know, is front of mind and many people that I talk with, the mechanisms by which those occur, many of them policy are not in the usual wheelhouse of landscape architecture. And so if you think that landscape architecture is a uh, site design and is that kind of scale it is, and we have an excellent legacy there, but we have an incredible growth opportunity, uh, an incredible opportunity for influence to influence policy. And in terms of our culture and our community as Black Americans in the United States, we have a great legacy to draw upon in terms of how to make social change, civic action, uh, which is being demonstrated in the streets now, especially since the uh, murder of George Floyd. Uh, and you know what's probably on the minds of a lot of students who are listening is the changing nature of our professions. Even when I was in school, the goal was to get into the best office you could get into so that one day your project is on the cover of Landscape Architecture Magazine too. We were super superficial, right? We weren't that deep. Uh, right now, the global imperatives are totally different. It's literally life and death now in terms of how we handle the planet. Uh, there are immediate consequences in terms of how we affect uh, uh, the things around us and how they affect us. And we've heard, and even in my class, you know, I hear from students, uh, frustration that it's considered a one-size-fits-all profession where the skill sets, the information that people are exposed to, the examples that they're shown, are all modeling a way of practice that's out of line with really providing the most, most impact to the issues that are facing the day. And so there have been sea changes in other professions uh, that have affected how they've been organized, uh, what their focus is, where their revenue streams come from, but landscape architecture late to the party. So the idea that our professions are changing and that we need to change with it and that imperative comes from the ground up is something that's important uh, moving forward. In terms of pathways and as an educator, uh, uh, an article that I wrote several years ago that uh, people have started to read uh, is Black Landscapes Matter. Uh, it was in response to a call from my friend Walter Hood, who hosted a conference of the same name and actually is uh, publishing a book by the same name later this year on this topic. And what it was was a call to uh, really radically rethinking how we frame landscape architecture, you know, from its roots, you know, to the shoots. The, the whole uh, way of thinking about it is you can move through our entire profession, go through classes for years, work in firms, and never interact with Black people or Black culture, and somehow that's acceptable and that's good. Concurrently, there are other professions, uh, creative outlets, uh, that have seen massive increases in participation and exposure, particularly by Black people. And so why is that? And so as an educator, something that I spend my time on is uh, how through our academic systems, we can make changes that uh, start, first start with acknowledgement and representation on two ends, one of harm, done. Uh, very well-intentioned landscape architects, architects and planners have done terrible harm to our communities uh, and been rewarded with awards and with contracts. Uh, at the same time, uh, many examples in our communities that aren't documented well that's, that, that have served as uh, evidence of our ability to affect the built environment for resilience and sustainability have been ignored from the canon. And so it's started to put that, uh, that proposition out there that we can start from how we tell our story of landscape architecture to how we provide experiences to our students, to how we disseminate our best practices and our research, to how we arm our next generation landscape architects to go in the field to change these uh, real uh, barriers to how we think about things. 
uh, and the energy of the moment, it's important to note that this isn't unique. And I know that it's hard to hear for people who are younger uh, that uh, there were previous eras where these conversations occurred, where there was equal amounts of social unrest, instability, and, and discomfort. Uh, just in the 20th century alone, you know, a touch point is 1968, which had two monumental uh, uh, events that really framed the conversation we're in today for the good or the bad. Uh, one was the Kerner Commission report, uh, which came out in the United States, which talked about the United States moving into two separate countries, one white, one black, and unequal. Uh, in that same year, uh, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, Whitney Young gives the AIA keynote address uh, where uh, he was asked by people uh, in the AIA to kind of calm the calm the waters, you know, that people were revolting in the street, were burning things down, and we need somebody to kind of throw water on that and smooth it out. And instead, Whitney Young brought gasoline. Like he ignited the fire and said, you know, everybody in this room, you know nothing about the communities that you serve. There's nobody in this audience that's representative of the communities that you claim to be working for and challenge everyone, you know, what are you going to do with it? And so that was a major uh, public statement that led to a, a lot of change that we now know was not sustained, right? That a lot of energy was not sustained. And just as an anecdote, Ann Paul Freeberg, who was uh, the founder of CCNY's program, one of the reasons why that program was founded was his observation that there weren't a lot of black and brown landscape architects in his practice time, and that uh, the creation of a program in an urban university might have a better chance of attracting more so that we have people with the same cultural context uh, framing the issues and framing the processes to serve our communities. Uh, partner with ASLA in order to get that occurred. So the very program that we're, that's hosting this particular presentation was born of this, this desire and this need in our profession to make a difference. And we can see where that stands now. It's difficult because uh, a lot of our work in landscape architecture, even though we're an established profession, is still young, uh, barely 100 years old in terms of research and scholarship, uh, compared to civil engineering and architecture, very small. Uh, but the trends are the same, the same numbers that were cited before in terms of less than 4% Black and African American practitioners in landscape architecture, same for architecture, same for urban planning, same for urban design, same for civil engineering. And so this idea that we're isolated and alone because of our small number is not true. There are other issues at play that affect our level of agency and influence and awareness on how we can make change in the built environment which speaks to the potential of transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches that start to break down silos and talk about the common interests of health and strength and resilience of the built environment is of shared interest, in which case we can pitch a bigger tent and work forward from there. I'll close with uh, uh, just a comment, is that I'm in the reform camp. So I'm in the Landscape Architecture Foundation. I'm a member of ASLA. I teach in a predominantly white institution. I think these systems can be changed. I think that there are things that are in our purview that we haven't had the courage of our conviction uh, to really unite on and stand on to make changes. But what I've noticed in the next generation is they're in their revolt camp. They don't want to reform these institutions. They want to create new ones and new systems. And so that's really the conversation that I'm really interested in is the idea, do we need new ways of practicing? Do we need new revenue streams to support alternative ways of practice? Uh, do we need to decentralize a lot of we, what, what we do in order to survive and to thrive? Or can we rely on continued pressure uh, on the institutions that exist today? And I think it's a little bit of both, but I think that it's reflective even in the composition of the panel and the, top, the topics that have been addressed is that uh, it, it is a revolutionary time. And so for all of us, we have to think about what our role might be in that. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. Next up, I'd like to introduce our moderators tonight that will be leading the roundtable discussion. Garrett Ray is a City College of New York graduate, class of 2019. He is an ISA certified arborist and currently a construction manager at SiteWorks Landscape Architecture in New York. Gina Pearl Fletcher is a second year MLA student at City College of New York, a lead green associate and an ASLA student chapter treasurer. Garrett and Gina, before you guys get started, let's take a look at the poll results together.
All right. So uh, the first poll uh, is based on uh, the ethnic backgrounds of our attendees. And uh, so we have in a majority of uh, Caucasian uh, attendees at 68%. Uh, 9% are Black, 8% Asian, 5% Latino, 0% uh, Native American, and 8% that prefer other. Uh, which may be reflective of a lot of the conversations that we've uh, been having in this uh, discussion today. Uh, another, another, the second question is, what do you do? Uh, so of the attendees, 64% of them are working landscape arch architect professionals. Uh, one, one percent and one of one person is an architect. Uh, there are 20 percent students, so 19 people, and six percent that are in the academic, uh, the academic field. Uh, next is time zone. Uh, so where are you from? So we have 73 percent people come calling in from the U.S. East Coast, uh, four percent from the center of the country, and. 19% uh, from the U.S. Pacific time. So we uh, are basically based on the East Coast, but uh, we do have a good amount of people that are spread out across the country. And thank you all for taking that poll and sharing who's in the room tonight. All right, Gary, you wanna take Karen, it away? Gina, yeah, take it away. Okay, so, <laughs> Now is an opportunity for academic institutions to address the gaps of representation, historical accounts of landscape architecture and the foundational precedents that omit and or underplay black practitioners, or perhaps less formally, the way black workers engaged, constructed and maintained US landscapes. How do you envision these gaps being filled and its impact on future landscape professionals? Anyone? I, I, I guess, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll speak to the practitioner side because it's a side that um, I'm currently involved in. I think there, um, there's definitely a, a moment in time right now where, again, a lot of these panels are being put together to, to advocate on the behalf of Black voices and minority voices to allow people to speak on their experience and things of that nature. But one of the things I tried to touch on um, and my presentation is that hopefully this is sustained. So like, you know, um, in regards to the experience as a black designer, it, it shouldn't just be about how fraught it is with, you know, um, neglect or racism or, you know, malpractice within, within the field, but it should be about what that experience um, um, represents for um, the discipline of landscape architecture. So what do um, the, the lived experience of minorities in regards to, um, you know, working in the communities that they come from or, you know, communities similar to them um, have in the field of landscape architecture. Um, discussion on um, the Black Land Call uh, over the weekend was, you know, even speaking in regards to um, climate change. And, you know, as Kofi mentioned, a lot of the communities that are going to be um, adversely affected by um, climate change are minority communities. And how does uh, landscape architecture uh, address, you know, um, these communities, but then also give um, give a representation in, in, the, in the work of the communities as well. So if we were gonna be working um, alongside these folks that are gonna be affected by climate change, we should be, we should at least be mirroring them to some extent. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of hopefully where I see, you know, practice kind of headed. And like Kofi said, I might be, I'd like to think I'm half revolution, half uh, reform, because I'm still a member of ASLA. Um, and, you know, I, I'm the chair of the digital technology PPN. So like a, a part of ASLA in, in a lot of ways, but then also I think um, there has to be a push in, in, in regards to establishing new practices and, and, and setting a, an example for something that's different than what has been before.
Um, if there's time to answer, um, I thought this was one of the broader, more difficult because it was one of the broader questions. And as I was listening to um, Andrew give his answer, you know, give his response, I was just thinking in comparison about the the inroads that other, um, let's say, professionals have made. Uh, I think. Uh, I think that black doctors um, uh, for a very long time struggled with issues of credibility. I, mean, I, th I think one of the issues for minority practitioners is one of credibility, let me just put it that way. And, and what that means in a very tangible way in terms of potentially pigeonholing, uh, I could go on and on. But if, if I were to make a comparison, um, whether or not there were any sort of tangible or measurable inroads that the other professions have made and, and what that would mean in comparison to us. Um, I, for me, I, I think it, it, it because I own, I own a firm, the, the, the question I always have is about the nature of access to work and the difficulty in our profession in the way that things are structured because um, uh, if you, particularly if you work in the public sector, if you don't know this, students, you definitely should, that there are no retainers. And so the, the financial resources that it takes to, to work in an area that, that services our communities is very expensive. You have to front that money. You have to wait to get paid. You have to you know, maintain all these other aspects of the business. And, and that financial struggle is, is, is shared by all, everybody in the architecture and engineering profession, but it, it hits us particularly hard because historically we don't have access to the same supportive resources that other communities have. And so you're coming to the table, um, even if you put up your house um, for mortgage, you know, already behind, behind the eight ball. And there is a perception that even if you're not behind the eight ball, that you are behind the eight ball. So what it would take to change perceptions about service delivery and the ability of, of, of black and brown practitioners to, to deliver services, I mean, that's miles deep. That is miles deep, but you have to start somewhere. And I think one of the issues is access to work. Access to work is, is one of those big questions that the attitudes around access to work are some of the big questions that have to be addressed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those answers um, or those perspectives. So um, my question is coming from a student perspective. I've noticed and I've been following a lot of Instagram accounts that have a period of anonymous black employees feeling unsupported at their offices and giving and sharing their experiences in the workforce. Majority of these offices have also released BLM uh, statements and um, are reflecting on their environments and culture. So I'm wondering what's your feedback or what do you recommend students that are entering those spaces as an intern or a new hire that finds this environment? Um, I, I would advise um, students entering um, professional practice to just not expect it to be easy. Um, that's, I think that's part of it initially. Um, but at the same time, not having your guard up so much so that you um, internalize things too much. Um, and you need to keep outlets, you need to keep networks of like-minded people um, that may be mostly outside of your work. Um, and, you know, I think we have to continue to um, challenge the, the workplaces and the, the culture there and um, the decision makers um, and speak up for ourselves and speak up for other people. 
Um, and, you know, if in 2020 a company or a firm or an agency did issue um, a statement in support of Black lives, um, you know, for the first time in 2020, um, it's, it's, I think it's not out of the question to uh, make sure that they're upholding what they put in that statement. Um, even if the statement was uh, biting off more than they were willing to chew at the time, um, make sure that they continue chewing what, what they put out. I would, I would say a perspective on that is that um, from my understanding, not just as a, as a young practitioner, um, been uh, black practitioners that landscape architecture um, practices um, in a large part are not very supportive of young practitioners period whatever color you are, you are to be perfectly honest um, you know so uh, there I think there's there is work to be done on a whole front of like advocating for you know um, younger practitioners placed within within a larger um, framework of any office, you know, like uh, people have spoke about, you know, the existing um, hierarchical structure of design services where, you know, there is a principle that kind of like, you know, it's like, this is the design, you cat it up and, you know, there's, 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 um, there's a history there that doesn't allow um, for younger voices, um, maybe particularly minority voices, um, to, to be at a seat at the table where they feel like, you know, they're being heard or have some equity in terms of um, uh, design decisions or being supported. But I think, you know, I think that's a problem with like just design, how it's structured, especially in terms of how offices are made up, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, something that is goes from principal to associate to senior designer to um, entry level designer. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, I want to echo uh, Andrew's statement on that. There is a lot of virtue signal going on. That's that's true. Um, uh, I do think that um, there there's some math that students need to go through, right? So it's like a profession where it's hard to get an internship. You know, and then so you're on the fence about, you know, you look at the name on the door, you know, they want a couple of awards, about to spend a couple months there interning, might open up some doors and I graduate, build a relationship. I mean, that's a logical sort of way of thinking about it. But even on this call, we got a prominent professional who says she's not getting enough applications. There are other professionals who are excellent, you know, that do have those values and those morals and and it, I think in some ways, the level of agency of a student to go out and do the research to figure out what these firms are about and reward the ones that align with your values. And in some cases, that might present a challenge when you're faced with you know, other opportunities. But I think that it's an opportunity to uh, uh, not only work in places that support your values, but learn from people who are actually trying to practice in that way. So uh, the, the big coffee table book, firms are not the only show in town. Uh, so encourage people to, to get out there and, and look at what a lot of these firms and a lot of these practitioners are actually about. I've been holding my tongue <laughs> because uh, this is an issue that is really central, most dear to my heart and central to my practice for a number of reasons. And, and uh, um, there isn't one person who walks through my doors and they say two things. Um, they say they want to save the world, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and they, they want to leave school saving the world, right? And um, they want to come to my office, learn everything that they can, and then go out and start their own business. I'm going to start with number two. Never say that. Never, never. It's no, 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 no. And, uh, and if it's I know somewhere somebody gave you that advice and yes, you are here to learn. This is a profession where you learn your entire life. You, you work for 20 years and then what you do is you realize what you don't know, <laughs> right? And then you go from there. So, so those expectations, you know, I'm, I'm raising it because, because there, 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 there seems to have been a breakdown in 
in some aspects of, of communicating the timeline in the profession. Um, I blame the computer, but we could have another conversation about that. But if you're going to come to a firm where social justice is the focus, you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared because that firm as a business or a nonprofit is operating on fumes. <laughs> They're operating on the thinnest of margins. The commitment that you make to this area of work means that you're spending far more time on this type of work than you're ever being compensated. And there's an interesting article, I think it was in the New York Times about changing the work paradigm and, and sort of, in my opinion, resolving the ambivalence between going into this profession as an artist or going into this profession as a worker. And they were suggesting that, that for the, the work-life balance issues and the dissatisfactions around that, you need to understand yourself as a worker. That's a two-way, that's, a, that's a, a two-sided coin. Right? You, need to be on, you need to understand your value to the company. And you have to be prepared because if you want to hit the ground running, you have to be able to have, you have, to have the tools to, to be able to interpret the information that's coming your way. If you work in, I'm not a top-down firm. I'm, the people who work for me think I'm crazy because I give them a lot of responsibility and decisions. And, you know, they flounder for a very long time. Um, other firms, it's very top down. It's very much, I'm um, the principal, this is my, this is my thought on the matter. I want it drawn up. I'm not going to debate in between, but I will say that it is your obligation as a student to be prepared to enter the workplace. And part of that means that with your understanding of your preparedness, your expectations should be aligned. And it's particularly when you come to to small minority owned underrepresented companies, this is more critical than less. I guess my, my feelings towards that is that I, I want to be like, of course, I want to be supportive and I want to be partaking in those visions. And at the same time, I also think about the tuition that I have to pay back too. And how do we figure out a way to change this paradigm where it is this choice of, of the values versus compensation to, to sustain our, our livelihood, say, living in New York City, for example. Elizabeth, Actually, can I jump in on that? Go ahead. I just, I just wanna no. just, I wanna talk about some misconceptions like, and I think this is something that I, again, was speaking through personal experience from my talking to and friends that I've known um, as various practitioners. It's my understanding that I think the smaller firms pay better. Like, uh, I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. They like <laughs> they do <laughs> like, like exactly just from my own experience. And then folks that I, that I talk to smaller firms pay better. Um, and then, and then also I think, like like uh, Elizabeth and, and Kofi said, there's there's a level of accountability in regards to um, you as an adult, not just like as a practitioner. Um, New York has very high cost of living. Period. Now I don't I don't care what industry you're in. So um, if you want to work in New York, know what it comes with. You know, I my second job I went to Austin. No state tax. That was definitely an incentive. <laughs> you know, not only was I making more money, a smaller firm, but again, no state tech. I mean, there's, there's some choices that you might have to make that um, if you're talking about your own, like, you know, self-preservation that might be outside the wheelhouse of your, your perceived comfortability. You know, do you want to live in New York City and live some type of life that you think you want to live or do you want to pay off your student loans and work someplace that's a little bit, um, um, less familiar to the, the larger ethos of landscape architecture. Like, I think you're going to have to make those decisions as a, as a adult, you know, you know, like cut the student thing out. You, you're an adult. Uh, so actually I think this would be a great 
chance to segue to one of the asked questions by one of my favorite people in the world, Catherine Siebert Norderson. She says, uh, uh, why does the New York Parks Department still maintain unpaid internships? Is this an, uh, this is an exploitation of labor in the landscape profession. Unpaid internships are not permitted under the ethics rules of the AIA. When will ASLA and city agencies follow suit? Um, so I'm not defending unpaid internships as someone that suffered through uh, that situation. But um, when, when was that officially uh, ruled as like illegal? Do you know? Because um, just for, just because my unpaid internship that I referenced was in 2012. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's not, it's not good. It's not sustainable for the person working and oftentimes that person in, is in a, a position of desperation. I think, uh, I think a lot of, I think you're absolutely right. And that a lot of uh, people that do take those positions, take them hoping that they'll be able to get the foot in the door uh, like you were able to. But in order for them to take that uh, opportunity, they have to be grounded in a way that a lot of people that don't come from, uh, that may not have the support systems to support themselves without a actively paying uh, job uh, may have to overlook. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely couldn't um, afford to, for that to be my only um, job. Uh, at the time, I had two other part time jobs and I had zero days off. I would do a morning shift at you know, in retail and then evening uh, tutoring sessions. And then I was only doing the internship uh, three days a week. And then I just like teetered that down to two days a week and then eventually once a week because it was just it was just too much. But I kept going. So it wasn't like a full time uh, unpaid internship because I did have to work um, two other jobs to pay rent with three roommates off of Craigslist, like it was a lot, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's not something that I think should still continue. Uh, so the next question up uh, is uh, cue the ASLA demographic slide. And uh, hold on. Here we go. So uh, looking at the current change in professional culture, do you think that the national and or regional ASLA chapters have a role to play? And if so, how and where? Could you repeat the question? Absolutely. Uh, so looking at the current change in professional culture, do you think that the national and or regional ASLA chapters have a role to play? If so, how and where? Well, I think, I think that the, the regional chapters, the state chapters absolutely have, have a role to play. Um, I could take as an example, New Jersey is very aggressively addressing issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. They're very intentional about it. They, they, it, they have an annual conference. It is part of the agenda of the conference. They raise questions about it. They, um, they have workshops. They look at the question. Um, and that intentionality is is something that I think that most chapters, if they're serious about the question, would have to um, would have to commit to. Um, 
there, there, there are larger questions. I mean, one of, you know, I guess you, you would put it, you know, how do you, how do you clean your own house? Um, there are, um, I hate to be so vague about this. I, you know, there, there are um, opportunities to address to address these questions um, that that perpetu that are perpetually superficial and and it's it's a it's beginning to be frustrating as to why that continues. Um, it, the profession has to diversify. It has to, it, it it has to diversify, or it's going to find itself left behind. It's going to find itself um, not responsive. So even if there were not ethical reasons to, to look at the question, but, but survival questions, at some point the profession has to start to look hard at these questions. And I believe that national sets the tone, but it's, it's a state by state issue because, because it's nuanced. I'm gonna say affecting it is systemic. Uh, membership is only one metric of uh, impact. Uh, so there are a lot of factors in the life cycle of someone going from a want to be a landscape architect to actually being a landscape architect uh, that are specific to Black people and Black communities. I mean, the first one is, uh, you know, there's, and there's opposite ends. When we have this conversation where I am, the practitioners look at the educators and they're like, you're not producing enough. Uh, black folks to get into these positions. And then we look at the others like, well, there's not enough work for you to incentivize some gold at the end of the rainbow to encourage people to go down that path. But it indicates that there are multiple layers to it. So we'll just start with basics. We know when kids are most open and aware to environmental professions uh, and environmental and ecological experiences and it's before they get to middle school. And there's a book called Last Child in the Woods. It's about nature uh, deficit disorder. And it talks about that specific issue, not on racial lines, but it says that uh, once kids get to about 10 years old, their brain development changes, cognitive development, they focus more on social bonding and fitting into their social groups. But until they get to 10, you know, they, they track people. And when they're adults, they talk about, well, why did you join that environmental organization? Why did you choose that environmental profession? And cross-culturally and around the world, it's because of some experiences that happened when they were really, really young that were positive and that were encouraging. And then you think about, well, where are those experiences available to our communities, you know, for children of that age? Uh, and also uh, how landscape architecture in some ways is divorced from other entities where communities have been making pushes. So, you know, where I'm from in Detroit, you know, even when I was young, it was a push for STEM. It was a push for, we need more black science, technology, engineering, math professionals. Is landscape architecture a part of that? Does that start to appeal to families who are trying to make a decision about their child being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, equal amount of school, equal amount of debt, different payoff in the end, right? Landscape architecture doesn't roll off the tongue. Most people think it's a landscaper and you're like, why are you going to grad school to be a landscaper? There's like a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a cumulative effect of, of awareness building uh, at the individual and the community scale. Uh, but there, 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 there are key moments where connections can be made, where if someone has that environmental exposure as a kid, and then they have a positive experience with uh, uh, learning about the profession, and they have uh, a community uh, that understands the role of landscape architecture, is willing to support them as they move forward in the next stage, and then they get to college. And so this is something that's come up in other professions. There's a high correlation between uh, black and brown faculty and black and brown students. So uh, that came out in the last round of protests before the George Floyd movement, specifically in engineering, and with HBCUs in particular, that, that was an indicator. And that's what a lot of students were asking for was representation in the classroom. So students who understood your cultural context, you know, could relate to you and support you in ways that others could not. Uh, folks who would challenge the, the canon. Uh, so from history and theory to uh, the types of projects that people worked with to the dynamics you have on a community engaged process that it does matter who's in the room and what their cultural lens and their mindset is. And you can actually do just as much damage as you can good, which is to say uh, instructors have a lot of power in terms of framing what landscape architecture is to the next generation. You know, so all that occurs in the academic space before you even get to the professional space. And so this idea that, uh, and I think it does relate back to something that I think Elizabeth said much more effectively, 
what your expectation is at that point, which is to say, um, moving on into the professional world does come with a tremendous amount of personal responsibility. Uh, but there are barriers. We know those in terms of gender. Like the main reason why a lot of uh, women in architecture drop out at key stages is because of uh, differential treatment when it's time to start a family, have children, and that sort of thing. So people who are single, particularly people who are male, you know, it's just kind of geared that way. Landscape architecture, I'm going to say, is probably similar. So there's systemic and multi-level changes. And I think that, at least in my experience, that it is very much determined by um, uh, uh, sort of a push from the ground up uh, to encourage these leaders at the state level to pay attention to things. I think that might be a reason why New Jersey might be doing what they're doing. Is that uh, uh, there's a there's a demand, there's a push for it. There's 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 there's, there's pressure to say, hey, we have to do this in order to meet these certain objectives. But the point I wanted to make was that it's a multi-tiered, multi-layered uh, way of looking at it. It's not uh, one magic shot that's going to fix it. And that brings me to my follow-up question was, what networks or com communities have you leaned on in your journey? Um, I have personally, personally leaned in on a network of just like-minded coworkers in general. Um, and working um, for the government and working for a uh, New York City agency and specifically for the Parks Department, it's often hard for other landscape architects or even other Black professionals to understand the intricacies of work life at parks um, because it is just very different. Um, and I've also leaned on like-minded Black people on social media in a variety of fields. Um, and that's something that's more and more accessible nowadays. Um, yeah, so I would just recommend that. It doesn't have to be like a specific, I mean, it's good to keep contacts from school, uh, from your programs and good to have mentors, definitely, but there are other um, resources as well. Um, I'd say, um Throughout my career, I've definitely had a variety of um, uh, folks to lean on. Um, definitely um, colleagues from, you know, um, from Olin, this first uh, firm that I worked on, uh, worked at. Um, uh, definitely, I would have to give credit to the Landscape Architecture Foundation in terms of um, their support in regards to the fellowship program that was kind of the seed for the birth of the Urban Studio and their continued um, kind of effort for um, you know, uh, supportive of uh, uh, minority practitioners. Um, and of course, the Black Landscape Architecture Network. Um, I mean, there was a, a point in time that like, you know, I was talking to Elizabeth and Kofi like almost every week um, over, <laughs> over the summer. So it's great to, you know, um, to, to talk to um, both of them, not only as, you know, colleagues, but as, as, as friends too, you know, um, and kind of shortening that gap in, 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 in that respect. Um, I think um, I, would, I would tell young uh, minority practitioners to, um, this is my reform hat on, you know, join ASLA at the, at the, the local as well as national level. I mean, um, ASLA is like pining for people to participate in a number of committees, whether it's ethics, environmental justice, and, and so forth. Um, there's definitely room for your voice to be heard. Um, and I think, you know, uh, if, if, if your goal is to have some of these larger organizations make change, you gotta be participatory in that change, um, especially if you want it to go a specific way. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the times I hear of critique of ASLA is from folks who don't actually participate in ASLA, which I think is like, you know, all right, okay, you know. Um, but um, I think, you know, whether you want to either either join a specific committee, ASLA, or um, if you're a Black practitioner, join the Black uh, Landscape Architecture uh, Network. Um, I think there's there's some avenues for you to, to kind of find some support and mentorship and so forth. And we've also created a slide of all these Black design networks that are available, as well as 
black firms across the country. And we also wanted to give a special thank you to Black Land. Um, Glenn LaRue Smith, founder and president, um, through, its partner, through their partnership with LAAB, we were able to create a visibility of Black representation in the field academically and professionally with these slides. We appreciate you. So we are actually going to fit in one more question, I believe, for approaching seven. Um, so um, how do you partake in self-preservation in this industry with high pressure deadlines and standards of work? And how has it changed for you since the prevalence of these two pandemics of COVID and the broader examination of racial injustice? No, who wants to jump in on that one first? There's a lot. One's corny, but gone outside. So True. one advantage of landscape architecture is that, um, you know, hopefully we're all learning the restorative, healing, and supportive uh, roles the landscape can play. So sometimes it means getting away uh, to places that don't have a lot of population density, unfortunately, these days. But um, there's so much research and, you know, for many of us, we know that those are the most restorative moments we have is, you know, when you can feel the wind, you can see the sun, uh, you can touch the water, you can hear the animals, you know, those are, those are things that we've carried with us for many, many, many generations. So that, uh, that's something that's always a touchstone for me. I'm, I'm a little bit, so easier for me here because I'm in North Carolina, which is not as dense as New York City, but I think even uh, in New York and where you all are, there are places where you can take a moment, take a breath. Uh, and reflect on uh, the world that we've decided to participate in. Um, I have to agree with that. Um, I do live in New York City, but I do have um, an outdoor space, uh, a community owned outdoor space that I can go to and it's been very helpful. Um, I also think that a lot of people underestimate <laughs> some basics and some basic things that pop up in like every blog article that everyone raves about, like uh, just a hot bath with like lavender, eucalyptus, Epsom salt, like don't overrate that. <laughs> um, don't overrate yoga and meditative stretching and candles, fall candles. Just, I know these things might sound corny, but they, I, I, I find them all beneficial. And especially like if you weren't doing it before and 2020 has been a struggle, um, 2020 has been so hard for so many people. Um, you know, my family, my friends, um, I, I know several people that have passed um, just and job loss, it's, it's been a lot. So I have um, leaned in on those things uh, just heavier this year. I think, um, oh, Elizabeth, you wanna go? I think I would definitely echo what Kofi said. I mean, I go for walks almost three times a day, um, one in the morning, one at lunch, and probably go for one after this call. Um, but uh, I think one thing um, I will say to kind of the self-preservation work-life balance thing is to, you know, um, is to kind of fall in love with the work. You know, I think there's 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 less of a of a need to, you know, I, all the times are tough, and I'm not trying to, you know, um, make make any any slide of that. Um, there is. Um, a helpful balance or a helpful factor to being in love with the work that you do. Um, and if you can find that, um, it makes the idea of self-preservation like not really so key to what you're doing in your day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, um, before uh, 
a lot of the, the presence of the discussion of being a black practitioner was even in my purview. The main thing I was focused on was just being a good practitioner and falling in love with the work. So I think, you know, that's always been um, uh, a very good steering, you know, point for me. And in, in when things get hard is that, you know, I love what I do. So I think if you can find that um, with all the, the stuff that's going on, um, that should definitely help. I wanted to add, to, to build on specifically what Andrew said, I, you, you have to pace yourself. Um, pandemic or no pandemic, you have, to, you have to have habits that allow you to pace yourself. This is a marathon and you don't, you don't start to decide to run a marathon after sitting on TV, watching, eating ice cream and watching TV for six months. You, it, you know, that has consequences. This is, this is, and, you know, um, you have to understand that you're going to have to put in the 10,000 hours. You know, the, the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in terms of mastering something, becoming, it's, it, that's, that's the average, that's a 10. So, so I think what, what my generation kind of took with a pound of salt, you know, rather than a grain, but understood it is that the, the time commitment is extraordinary. What this, what's different from when I got out of school when dinosaurs were ruling the earth was that there are a lot of ways of being in landscape architecture that don't have to do with design, right? We have some, but Garrett's on, Garrett's involved in the construction management end. There are a lot of other, Kofi talked about the policy end. There are myriad ways of being involved. If you want to call it almost like beyond the studio, beyond, beyond the pen and paper, that are equally important and equally meaningful and that might allow you to have the type of balance that is really important to you because that's an, an individual choice and decision. Um, I think, I think, you know, when we talk, you know, you always have, I was saying the other night that we need to have a TV show. Nobody agreed with me, but we need to have a TV show where people are staying up all night and they're going after RFPs and they're stabbing each other in the back and, they're, you know, they're, they're sabotaging each other's, other's proposals and they're losing models and they're deleting the Revit model. That's a big one. <laughs> right? you know, they're doing all of these things and all of this drama um, because we actually live it. This is, you know, we talk about high pressure and we talk about all these other stresses and what we're talking about is drama. So not everybody's about the drama, but they're in the same way that, that lawyers have, some lawyers have lives, right? Not every lawyer that you know goes and, and defends serial, successfully de defends serial killers. You know, they, you know they're, they're, there's diversity in that profession and, and I think what we were touching on, and I think it's, particularly important for our community is to understand and to push for the diversity in aspects of practice and not just to have, you know, representation, but actually access to different areas of being able to make, to do good, to do good, right? And that I think students can start to demand. So, you know, like, you know, you're consumers, you're, you're going into debt, you're, you know, racking up, you know, you're postponing your futures, you can't buy a car, all of those other things that make the economy run. You need to make this work for you. But at the same time, you need to know what it is that the work is out there. So first of all, exhale now. It's important to exhale now and to develop the habits that allow you always to be able to step back because stepping back is important if only to service the interests of your clients. You have to understand what your clients are talking about. This business of designing a house around a, a faucet, that's ridiculous, that never happens, right? You, you know, everybody said, well, you know, it's about my ideas. It's never about your ideas. It's about what the client needs. And, and the sooner you get there, the, the sooner you can make some decisions about what, you, about what you feel that you want to contribute to the profession. Andrew is perfectly correct. Get involved if you want change you know, get involved, you know, show up at those chapter meetings and say, what is this nonsense? You know, be noisy. We know how to be noisy. We, you know, you go to the movies, we're noisy, right? So, so be noisy in the, chap in the chapter meeting, all of those things, but you have to pace yourself. 
you have to set goals. You have to be able to plan. You have to be able to say, when I reach this point and that point's going to be a Friday at five o'clock, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Right? Don't Starting call me to Monday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so it is 7.03 right now. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for <laughs> answering all of our questions for this discussion. Uh, Andy, did you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you all for the inspiring presentations and discussions. So unfortunately, we ran out of time to get to all of the other questions. However, in the evaluation form at the end of this webinar, there is a box for you to suggest what you would like to hear more of in future events that revolve around this topic. On behalf of ASLA New York chapter and the ASLA student chapter, we would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Many of these questions were just the very start of a longer and larger discussion that we hope to continue to evolve. And a special thanks to all the panelists, Drew, Mercedes, Elizabeth, and Kofi, the moderators, Garrett and Gina, and our team who put the session together, Lindsay, Kat, Emily, Jeff, and Sarah from CCNY, and Diane and Elizabeth from ASLA New York. Stay tuned for future webinars and have a great evening. And panelists and moderators, don't forget to click the debrief link after this. Thank you and have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.